on to consequences of RoboDebt news! RoboDebt, the government equivalent of a ghost that haunts your toilet. RoboDebt has been in the news again as the settlement of the RoboDebt lawsuit went before the courts. Now, or we've talked extensively about the horrible consequences of RoboDebt and the class action lawsuit that followed. So if you're interested in finding more background detail, go back and check out those episodes. But recently, a federal court has approved a $1.2 billion class action settlement. <coughs> Between Centrelink, RoboDebt victims, and the federal government, branding the scheme a massive failure in public administration, which might be the next contender for the Guinness World Record for the biggest understatement in the history of inaccurately describing things. I'm uh, still on phones to the officials and waiting for confirmation. Justice Bernard Murphy said that the use of flawed income averaging tools to raise debts was a shameful chapter. He also said that the federal government should have known that many people on social security do not have stable or consistent work and may earn income intermittently. After all, they spend a lot of time complaining that people need to work more, preferably on a farm somewhere. However, Justice Murphy was not convinced that the federal government knew the RoboDebt scheme was unlawful. Given the choice between a stuff-up and a conspiracy, one should usually go with a stuff-up, according to Justice Murphy. Now, I look forward to this new precedent, which is being set by the courts right now, more commonly being put in place. The precedent of, see evil, assume stupid. I'm not suggesting it is a conspiracy, but they definitely knew from a very early point that it wasn't lawful. Emails between top tax officials were published that showed that they were told by the Department of Social Services that debts raised solely on the controversial income averaging method were not lawful debts. And while the email did not say when the government received the advice, it strikes me as having knowledge in advance of an unlawful act, knowing it is wrong and then doing it anyway. And that is a classic conspiracy. And legally, one of the definitions of conspiracy is A, a person must have entered into an agreement with one or more persons. Well, the head of DSS certainly didn't enact this on their own. There would have been many discussions about what do we do with all the pause? But also, C, the offense of conspiracy is incomplete unless either the defendant or one other party to the agreement has committed an overt act pursuant to the agreement. An overt act is simply an act done pursuant to the agreement. And an overt act can be defined as an outward act that is done in furtherance of a conspiracy. And I would say following through with charging people under unlawful acts counts as an overt act. If knowingly acting on an unlawful action is not considered more than stupidity, it does change the shape of our legal system going forward. Clive Palmer will be left to run the country uninhibited. The man is a walking stupid act. Justice Murphy approved 8.4 million in costs to Gordon Legal and said the 680 people who objected to the settlement would be given the opportunity to opt out. QC and Kim Wexler, if she doesn't get killed in the Better Call Saul final season, Fiona Forsyth, who represented the group members, said the use of flawed income averaging tools to raise debts caused vulnerable people stress and humiliation attempting to evoke an emotional response from the coalition, forgetting that they had their emotions locked away in indefinite detention so that they do not risk feeling bad for people left to ponder eternity in an indefinite detention. Forsyth said victims were treated like criminals and left feeling like welfare cheats as they received rude calls from debt collectors and Centrelink staff. And that was before the RoboDebt started. Afterwards, Centrelink morning meetings 
took on a very different tone. Out of each and every one of you is a hard target search of every gas station, residence, warehouse, farmhouse, hen house, outhouse, or dog house in that area. Checkpoints go up at 15 miles. Your fugitive's name is Dr. Richard Kimball. Go get him. They had their tax returns garnished, were forced to take extra jobs or expensive loans, and suffered detrimental effects in their relationships and mental health, sometimes leading to self-harm. The automated matching of tax and Centrelink data to raise debts against welfare recipients the government claimed to have overpaid was ruled unlawful in 2019. The Commonwealth subsequently settled the case without admitting legal liability. Under the settlement, victims would receive $112 million in compensation and be repaid $720 million and have $400 million in unlawful debts wiped. Justice Murphy earlier described it as a good settlement, but also questioned how fair the ultimate distribution of funds would be. He said you've got a series of people with strong claims and weaker claims, and rather than apportioning them, the strong claims get everything and the weak claims get nothing. Justice Murphy said ministers and public servants should have known the method of using taxation income records to estimate a welfare recipient's average income was flawed. However, it is quite another thing to be able to prove the requisite standard that they actually knew the operation of the robodebt system was unlawful. Seems ignorance can be an excuse after all. Now the argument could be made, and as a judge you would be considering sentencing decisions. Now sentencing decisions have five purposes. Uh, just punishment, which is to punish the offender in a way that is fair in all the circumstances. Deterrence, which is to discourage the offender also known as uh, specific deterrence or other people general deterrence from committing the same or similar offences. Rehabilitation, which is to create conditions that help the offender lead a law-abiding life in the future. Denunciation, uh, to denounce, condemn or censor the offender's behaviour that is make clear to the community that the behaviour is wrong and community protection, to protect the community from the offender. Now, each sentence we impose must take the following principles into account. Proportionality, the severity of the sentence must fit the seriousness of the crime. Parsonomy, the sentence imposed must be no more severe than is necessary. Parity, co-offenders who are jointly involved in the same criminal behaviour usually receive similar sentences. Totality, when an offender faces more than one sentence, the total sentence must be just and appropriate to the offender's overall criminal behaviour, and crushing sentences. We avoid imposing a sentence so severe that it crushes any hope the offender will lead a useful life after release from custody. However, in some circumstances, such a sentence may be imposed if it is just and appropriate. A mitigating factor would normally be the offender's previous good character, which, quite frankly, the Liberal Party lacks. There is no previous good character to draw upon, and an aggravating factor would be a breach of trust by the offender towards the victim. Say, for example, I don't know, pulling a random example, uh, where a teacher commits a crime against a student or where, say, a government commits an unlawful act against the citizenry. So, unless you ask Josh Frydenberg, who, responding to the settlement outcome, pouted that the issue has now been dealt with, and then he stomped his little feet and he ran away, <laughs> saying there was a settlement, we have said we apologised, the Prime Minister has said that himself for the harm and the hurt and the hardship, that has been caused by the administration of the scheme. Delivering his apology with all the grace and humility of an eight-year-old who got caught stealing money from their sibling and had to return it and isn't allowed to leave until he apologizes and then takes the very adult route of reminding everyone what their sibling did, whining. It's very difficult when it comes to recovering debts, but uh, it is a process 
that has been adopted by successive governments and obviously we accept the settlement that has been announced by the court today. Obviously. Obviously. Duh. Not everyone of the 648,000 in the suit are happy with the settlement deal though. 680 have objected to the settlement and will be given the opportunity to opt out. Now, you might be confused as to why they wouldn't want some of that sweet, sweet $1.2 billion. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cash, cash, cash. Uh, a lead plaintiff in the settlement is having none of the government's shit, calling the response to the case inadequate, saying, I'm furious with the treasurer and his comments today. I come from a profession, uh, nursing, where our pillars of what we do are integrity, and accountability, and if this was to happen in my field of work, there'd be complete public uproar. Uh, fortunately, this plaintiff is not a fellow politician, or these comments would fuel an entire media cycle for days on end, mulling over the combative nature of the implications that the government is doing a terrible job. No, instead, uh, they're just a nurse, and so nobody listens to them. Jennifer Miller, whose son's rubber debt played a very prominent role in taking his own life, objected to the settlement in a previous federal court hearing, arguing that no one in power had been held accountable. Centrelink had pursued her son despite knowing that he had mental health issues and also gave private information about him to the media. In another case where a single person shows more integrity and compassion than the entire government, one Miss de Somerville had realised Centrelink had taken the equivalent of six months' wages out of her account without warning when she tried to pay for her one-year-old's medication for a bad chest infection. She also said that pursuing the legal case only increased her debt, but she was still happy with the outcome for victims who were not able to advocate for their own situation. It's not about me. An idea so genuinely foreign to our current Prime Minister he genuinely thinks that he was put in place by God to lay his hands of divine fate on as many people as possible.